Okay, quickly, what does the Quran ask of the believers? From the Quran's many exhortations and its descriptions of acts and types of individuals loved by God, it's not difficult to compose a partial list of things that the Quran wants us to do, which it calls good deeds, time and time again. To believe in God, to have faith in God, to have a relationship with God, and to do good. So what does it describe as these good deeds? Well, as I read through the Quran, it says that... Can I take this away? Remember, intellect, choice, suffering. It says we should show compassion. Show compassion. We should be merciful. I have the references here, but just excuse me, I'm not going to list them all. We're running out of time. We should be forgiving. Forgive others. We should be just. We should protect the weak and defend the oppressed. Defend the oppressed. We should be seek knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge, wisdom. Bear with me, ladies and gentlemen. We should be generous, truthful. And we should love our, oh, be peaceful. And we should love our fellow man. Love others. I'll just give you one verse, because I know we're running out of time, Madam Speaker. Truly those who believe and do good will the most merciful endow with love. And to this end, we have made this scripture easy to understand in your own tongue, so that you might convey a glad tiding to the God conscious and warn those given to contention. To this end, we have made this easy to understand, so that we'll learn to love others. Okay, that's all I'll say about that. I would like to say a lot more, but I don't have time. Now, what does the Quran tell us about God? You have to realize I'm just about through with the Quran here on my first time reading it. And now I was really caught. I searched my head. What does the Quran tell us about God? It tells us nothing could be compared to him. That is out anything, he's outside anything that we may compare to. That our definitions do not encompass him. That our reason cannot comprehend him. That he is transcendent and we are finite. That he is more, he, he is, un, uh, he transcends time and space and we are bound by it. That he is immortal, we are mortal. He is uncorporeal, we are corporeal. That we have no way of comparing ourselves to him. Nothing could be compared to him. I thought, oh my God, I'm so close and yet so far. Because I'll never understand the essential link between us and God and why these three things fit into place. Because the Quran tells us that we will, can never really quite understand God. Or at least that's the way I thought. And so I put down the Quran when I had finished it. And much to my dismay, I was honestly disappointed because I thought I'm just, the author made a brilliant, 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 brilliant try. But he never quite made it. <clears throat> and so I was sitting in front of, about three, four weeks later, I was sitting in Diamond Heights in my apartment watching a football game, I think it was. And you know, sometimes just things just slip into your minds when you least expect them, and I'm sitting there watching it, and all of a sudden into my mind came a thought. And I said, wait a minute. The Quran does tell us so much about God. It tells us again and again and again, but somehow I just missed it. Just skimmed over it every single time. Because if you turn to almost any page, if you turn to the beginning of any surah, you could see time and time again essential information about God that I just thought was sort of a literary device, something to make it just sound more beautiful. Because if you turn to the beginning of any surah, you'll see the words Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. 
If you read almost any passage, long passage, when you come to the end of it, it's punctuated by dual attributive statements like God is the merciful, the compassionate. God is the forgiving, the gentle. God is the kind, the protector. God is the generous, the truthful. God is, and so forth and so on. There are tens of thousands of such references in the statements in the Quran. What the Quran defines as God's most beautiful names, his attributes of perfection, repeated again and again and again on almost every page. And as I sat there, sitting by the television, I started to jot them down in my, you know, on my little piece of notebook there. Same notebook I used to jot these down before. And I began to list from my own mind the attributes of perfection as I remembered them. And they were, we should be, God is the compassion. God is the merciful. God is the forgiving. God is the just, the protector, the defender of the oppressed and the weak, the knowing, the wise, the generous, the kind, the truthful, the loving, the peaceful, the source of all peace, the truth, and so forth and so on. Every item I had listed it in my list for the qualities that we human beings are supposed to develop, the Quran was telling me that it's infinite source and perfection in Allah, in God. And then all of a sudden, all the pieces fell together. Then I suddenly saw it, as I see most of you probably see as well. That now, I mean, suddenly it all began to make sense to me. In what way do I say that? Well, it was now obvious why we had to develop these qualities. It was, no, it was now obvious how these things on the floor here fell into place. And I'll just say it clearly. We're here to develop a relationship with God, to become closer to God. But how can you become closer to God when he's transcendent and you're finite, when he's immortal and you're immortal, um, when you're in, vice versa? When he's immortal and you're mortal, when he's unbound, fettered by time and space, and you are, and so forth and so on, how can you become close to that one? If I want to become close to you, I need to have something to share with you, something that we have in common. So for example, if I want to get, come close to this young man here physically, I'll approach him, because we both have bodies, and I can position my body closer to him. Physical presence, bodily presence, is something we both share. If I want to become closer to that gentleman back there, if I want to become closer to him intellectually, I'll reason with him so we will have a convergence of minds, because we both possess reason. If I want to become closer to one of the, my sisters on this side emotionally, I'll try to appeal to their sentiments, because we both share feelings and similar types of experiences that generate those feelings. But how does one become closer to God? What do we share with him? We share with him exactly what he gave us. Because the Quran tells us that when we were, came into this life, he breathes into our spirit something of his spirit. And that we come into this world with the seed of these very qualities within us. And we could either kill them, stunt them, as the Quran says, or cause them to grow. And when we grow in these, we grow in our ability not just to experience tremendous beauty in life through all this, but we grow in our ability to receive and experience the infinite beauty, the infinite peace, the infinite truth, the infinite compassion, the infinite mercy, the infinite etc. all the way down, list, down the list that only comes from the infinite pers perfect source of all these. The more we grow in mercy, the more we grow in our ability to receive and experience in this life and in the next, to an infinitely greater degree, the mercy of God. The more we grow in compassion, the more we grow in our ability to receive and experience God's compassion in this life through prayer and through ritual and through contemplation and through other experience of others. And, and of course, infinitely more in the next life, the compassion of God. The more we grow in our truthfulness, the more we grow in our ability to experience God, the truth, because all truth comes from God.